And two things I, I would say on this matter. <coughs> Firstly, what we're the value of this discussion is basically to find out what the left did wrong. Because uh, there were some pretty good opportunities that were squandered in this period uh, as, uh, as one who takes as much uh, a lot of responsibility for it. Uh, I, I uh, must admit that is true. Um, objectively, it's been pro probably been possible for uh, the, the workers of uh, Ireland to take feed uh, the oppressor, to take state power for at least a hundred years. But uh, the 60s and 70s came nearer that uh, situation um, than before or indeed since, with, and their failure has led to the present um, situation in which everybody praises the, the, the people of Ireland for being showing restraint while the uh, uh, people who caused the present economic crisis uh, get new, their rewards increased. What did we do wrong? Um, I hope this this will um, this discussion will um, reveal and educate us, and we'll try and get it right this time. Because I don't think I'll be I for one will be around for, for if we get a third of it, when we get a third opportunity. So I'd like to see it before I die. Um, now, the second thing I'd just like to say is that we talk, there's a talk uh, mention of said era. In the time we're going to talk about, say, there were three organisations called Serera. Um, quite apart, quite apart from the fact that the original Serera way back in the 30s, but this was uh, there were um, the Serera group in Cork, which was a breaker, and there was the Serera Action Group. Both of them were, which were the Serera Action Group was mainly in Dublin. Both of them were breakaways from um, the Sinn Féin, Fein, from the Republican movement, and in the broad sense they were a part of the Republican movement. The Serra group in Cork uh, uh, was headed by uh, Jim Lane, who is still alive in Cork, uh, father of Fenton Lane. It uh, went through an adherence to Maoism, and uh, finally ended up uh, I think many, most of its members ended up in the Irish Republican Socialist Party, and so, apart from a one or two who ended up as academics in uh, the BBC. Um, then there was the Sarah Action Group, um, which um, perhaps most uh, celebrated was uh, Liam Sutcliffe, the man who uh, Blew up, uh, blew Nelson off his pillar, but uh, were, there were a number of excellent uh, people in it. Um, they had a less, nice, more Guevarist orientation. Well, they, of course, uh, would they they uh, um, were act activists far more than the Cork group were, and eventually uh, the police. Uh, um, got at them, they split, and what? And uh, one of them tries, survived, and then there was a breakaway from them, which uh, became, I think, uh, pretty well um, fascist. Uh, in fact, it could be said to be the godparents of, uh, I think, the, the, the parents of youth defense, which is sort of the, literally in, in some cases. So um, there are problems here uh, that we have to make things try uh, this meeting has to make things clear uh, to try to struggle part of the struggle to make things clear and make what is the strategy is and I won't um, uh, sort of hold you any longer but I will um, um, start um, by calling on our speaker, call on first, uh, Alan? Silence first. Okay, John, you want to speak first. Okay, call on John to speak. Yes, Alan. Oh, I, 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 I,
I'll go first because I'm going to try and be brief. I said try. Uh, well, I got involved in the, the, the left sort of that period very, when I was very young, the, the very end of the 60s, the beginning of the 70s. And there were very different times to now. We had an amazing amount of optimism. A very naive optimism, it has to be said, but there was, there was an awful lot of optimism around at the time. We'd seen the American Black Civil Rights Movement. We'd seen the Civil Rights Movement grow in the North. We'd seen the beginnings of the, 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 the modern women's movement. We were seeing the Black Panthers on television. We were seeing the Vietnamese, uh, as we saw it, like a gang of peasants on bicycles were beating the biggest military power in the world. Um, the iconography of Che Guevara was everywhere. There was just that, that mood that everything was up for grabs. Um, and was that one of the things as well that probably is indicative of optimism. A lot of the people that are the most difficult to organise in very optimistic periods it sometimes becomes possible. Uh, I was involved with a colleague just sitting there uh, in the, Don Conlon, in the the Irish Union of School Students in the very early 70s. I mean, we managed to build at one stage a paid membership of 7,000 school students around the country. We pulled off a number of school strikes. And I think the, the IUSS probably marked, to a degree, the beginnings and the ends of that period of optimism. The very beginning of the 70s, there were a number of school student groups that then had merged into students. By the mid 70s, it had essentially almost disappeared, become like a shell organisation. But it does give it that you can do something like that, gives it probably an idea of what the, the general feeling around the place was in the, the early 70s. Uh, for myself, I got into left politics, I suppose, by initially reading the one or two pamphlets by Connolly and then getting interested in other stuff. Sometimes people were very helpful, sometimes people were, looking back probably, off their heads. I remember when in my early teens, some people here probably remember him, Jerry Roach, uh, saying, oh yeah, he'd have a couple of pamphlets he could lend me, they'd be very good. And like, you know, I'm there in my early teens, and he gives me Engels, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, and you're sitting at home in a dictionary trying to work out what was this guy on about, what's its relevance, and, and you're stuck with it, though at the end of the day I'm not really sure I ever really figured it out, but not then. Great pamphlet. <laughs> Really? You, you find it difficult to read? I got to know uh, some people around the, 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 the young socialists, though I must say it ended up with Trotskyism not being attractive to me. So not because of anything particular that Trotskyists were saying, but uh, I suppose the, the two things, you know, it's a lot of pressure, especially when you're young and it's just sort of you see this thing, you see that thing, you don't necessarily link everything up together. And I, I had two sort of abiding memories of the of Trotskyists in Dublin. Because everybody on a Saturday would be outside the GPO selling their papers and pamphlets. You could have a dozen different organisations. Just remember, there was no internet or anything like that then. If you wanted to get ideas to people, you, you spoke them directly or you put something in writing in their hands. So you literally would have the whole length of the GPO, you know, different people selling their stuff, you know, socialist groups, Republican groups, the odd religious group, you know. If there, were, if there was more than two members in it who hadn't fallen out with each other, they were going to be there on a Saturday selling something. <laughs> And I, I remember one of the, 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 the Trotskyist groups, and they were called on everybody to support the provost. And I remember asking them, so why are Jews in the provost? Oh, well, we're the leadership. We couldn't put ourselves at risk. And I said, right, that's, that's not for me. Especially as the leadership at the time were all probably first-year students in UCD. Uh, and another group, uh, the League for a Workers' Vanguard. And I just there at the GBL say maybe picking up the Condi U paper and the Young Socialist and, and these guys were shouting at some other trots group, Menshevik, Menshevik! And there were all these people going, like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and, and instantly, like, uh, the League for Workers Vanguard, of course, had to change their name rather quickly when Bill Craig set up his Vanguard movement in the North. And so did the, the original Socialist Party, which was a breakaway from the official Republican movement, a sort of a more Stalin, they were, they were more Stalinist than the CP and wanted to become the official CP. But they'd also make the mistake of calling their paper Vanguard, so that had to go through a change very quickly as well. Um, some people would say, but why weren't the provosts so attractive at the time? Well, whatever people might think of them now, 
or in the 80s, certainly in the early 70s in Dublin, the provost with a very, very few exceptions, almost lone individuals, or people who had some sort of long-term plan, but the vast bulk of the provost were right-wing religious nationalists. Um, if they were running around with those politics today, you'd be asking, are you from mute defence? Uh, in 1974, Republican News, at the time you had two weekly Provo papers, you had Republican News based in Belfast and the Fublock in the South, and Republican News was supposed to be the slightly more radical one. Well, 1974 did a front page article, the whole of the front page, attacking contraception. Did you know among the other evils of contraception, it was a British plot to reduce the number of potential freedom fighters? <laughs> like, now, that is how not to attract idealistic young people into your movement. Uh, myself, uh, through meeting various other people in their teens in the school shooting movement uh, who had joined the official Republican movement, I quickly ended up in, in the officials, the stickies, which, as far as I'm concerned, was the, at that time, the only left group in Dublin of any size. Probably had about 300 active members in Dublin at the time. I think any other group on the left, you were talking at most, you know, in double figures. You were talking quite small groups. Um, and within the officials at the time, there was quite a lot of discussion. Its politics weren't solidified in the way the later Workers' Party became. Um, after the split with the Provost, there was several years of quite genuine, you know, an awful lot of thinking, discussion, talking about. It was a fair, you know, and it was a fairly good atmosphere to do it in until the the Stalinist wing got the upper hand, and then discussion was closed down very, very fast. And for myself, my break with the officials came in the mid seventies, when the United Irish Band ran a series of articles about the. Uh, socialist countries in Eastern Europe and you know you cast a cynical eye over stuff that they were saying about East Germany being some sort of paradise two or three cynical eyes over the one about Romania where people's living standards had shot way up but the uh, the limit really was when they did one about Hungary and they were talking about 1956 the Hungarian uprising being a fascist counter-revolution well, I didn't know much at the time, but it was pretty damn sure fascists didn't run around organising workers' councils, so there had to be something wrong. And with sort of uh, rethinking my politics and reading loads of other stuff and talking to people, I became an anarchist. I've been involved in the anarchist movement uh, since then. Like the, the vast bulk of my life has been within the anarchist movement, the trade union movement. I want to talk today about a little group that has sort of completely disappeared, I think, really from the, the pages of Irish history. And none of you will probably even recognise the name, the 1st of May group. In 1973, a small group of people, I was not one of them at the time, a small group of people uh, in Dublin resigned from the, the official Republican movement, and they, as a result of their sort of discussions, that they'd moved towards anarchism. Probably the two best known people in that group were uh, Noel Murray, who'd been a member of the Republican movement since the mid-60s, and Mary Murray, who'd joined at the end of the 60s, and of course they later became famous when they were sentenced to death in uh, 74, but I'll come back to that in a minute, 75. When they left the, the official Republican movement, they linked up essentially with a, a group in Britain around the magazine Black Flag, and the most prominent people there would have been Stuart Christie, who, again, I think at the end of his team, has been a former member of the Labour Party of Young Socialists in Britain. In fact, he'd been a junior orange man in Glasgow in his early teens. Uh, in his late teens, or maybe it was his early 20s, he headed off to Spain to try and assassinate Franco. Dressed in a Scottish kilt and that wrecking, that wouldn't draw attention to him. They just looked like a tourist. Didn't work. Got caught. Another story. He has a book about it. And the other, the other person there, Albert Meltzer, who had been involved in the British anarchist movement since the pre-World War II years. He was a compositor on the Daily Telegraph. So you see, you'll find anarchists anywhere. You can get them in the Daily Telegraph. You can get them anywhere. <laughs> These people and the group around them were very much in contact with the remnants of the Spanish resistance, the sort of clandestine armed groups that saw themselves as a continuation of the 1936-39 struggle. And to put this into a bit of context, the draw probably of the Spanish resistance and why it had kept going so long was that people often forget, after all the slaughter and bloodshed during the Spanish Civil War, 
that after the Civil War, between 1939 and 1949, mass executions continued. The minimum estimate is that one million people were executed in Spain between 1939 and 49 by the Franco regime. Some estimates have put it as high as two million, though I suspect they're exaggerated. In the early 60s, the Spanish anarchist movement much of us in exile in the, the south of France said, now look, we've been doing this clandestine hit and miss guerrillaism since Franco got power. It's not working. We should call it off. We should look for a better way to move forward. Some of the, the younger people around the Iberian Federation of Libertarian Youth uh, thought, no, we, we have to keep it going. Uh, in 1967, the 1st of May group was announced primarily based in Spain, but also with people in Britain, in Portugal, in France, in Belgium, a number of other countries. In March of 1974, the Spanish Cultural Institute on Northumberland Road had just recently opened, it wasn't open very long at all, and then it was petrol bombed. And after that attack, uh, the Sunday press was phoned up and the guy says, I'm speaking for the 1st of May group, we've exploded a bomb at the Spanish Cultural Institute, it's in retaliation for the murder today in Spain of the Spanish anarchist. The, the anarchist in question was Salvador Puy Gantich, a 26 year old student who was executed in Barcelona by, by the Franco regime. The 1st of May group also claimed responsibility for machine gun attacks on the American and Spanish embassies. And like so many others involved in legal activity, they turned to raising money through bank raids. In July of 74, uh, Bobby Cullen, Columba Longmore, Desi Keane, who was the brother of Frank Keane uh, of Serra Action Group, uh, they were sentenced to between five and seven years in jail for a number of, a number of charges, including uh, leaving a letter bomb outside the Iberia Airlines office on Grafton Street, armed robbery, possession, for, possession of firearms, ammunition and explosive substances, conspiring to cause explosions, and holding money they knew to be stolen. Uh, Noel Murray had also been charged with jump bail before the, the sentencing. And just the first guy I mentioned there, just, just an interesting, by the way, note, uh, Bobby Cullen, He'd been up in court previously in January of 72 in connection with Frascati House out in Blackrock. Now some of the, the, the more elderly but not quite dead yet people might remember Frascati House. Um, it was the former home of the United Irishman Lord Edward Fitzgerald and it stood where the Debenham store is today, just opposite the Blackrock uh, shopping centre. A suitable memorial. <laughs> um, at the time, a developer, which then was actually Roach's stores, wanted to knock it down and put a, a, a shop, a, another shopping centre there. And just about everybody else in the area, from the Dunleary Housing Action Group right through to the nice people of the Irish Georgian Society, wanted the, the house preserved as a historical monument. And the, the House and Action Group also wanted it converted so it would provide housing for, for people. Uh, on one occasion, the developer's architect was found at night in the house with a, a gang of men who were illegally vandalising the interior. Uh, then later, the developer was also caught for having paid people to strip off the roof of the house. Now, this would allow weather damage in, so it could be demolished as an unsafe structure, and the question of it being a historical monument didn't really arise anymore. In response to all this, some official IRA members moved in to defend the building. Um, they were accused of using explosives. In fact, the explosives were a couple of petrol bombs, which were never even thrown at anybody. The most that happened was... Uh, uh, a guard turned up with some of the developers' heavies and I think somebody pushed the guard, like he didn't even fall over. Uh, but Bobby Cullen ended up in court for that. And again, just speaking of Bobby, uh, after his sentencing he was in the Curra military prison which was used at the time. And he had there, uh, he there he joined a hunger strike which was started by uh, eight non-political prisoners um, over the... Uh, the, the, the visiting conditions and the, the, the really appalling standard of food that there was in the place at the time. And I remember the Prisoners' Rights Organisation, which 
Funnily, and he probably doesn't like being reminded of it, our local TD, Joe Costello, used to be uh, a leading member of, but they picked it in the Department of Justice and, and the prison down the court itself in support of the, the hunger strike. So the hunger strike ended about three weeks later, but I must say I'm not sure myself what the outcome of it was, whether they won anything or not. But anyway, on to the, the main play. September the 11th in 1975, uh, three people, plus presumably the driver of a car waiting, robbed uh, £7,000 from the AIB bank in Colester. An off-duty guard by the name of Michael Reynolds uh, saw them. He was out with his family in, in plain clothes. He, he saw them run off into St. Anne's Park, uh, clearly having done a bank job, and he gave chase. <clears throat> and he caught up with them when there was a scuffle in St. Anne's Park. And Mary Murray, who was blind as a bat without her very well-known at the time, thick, like, ends of bottle-type glasses, um, and uh, in the scuffle, uh, the gun went off and uh, she had accidentally killed him. Uh, there were about 200 homes around the city raided over the following fortnight. A number of people were taken in. As well as Noel and Marie, a uh, guy who had been accused of being the driver of the car, uh, very badly beaten in guard of custody. Uh, but he ended up not being charged. The person who was alleged to have been the third one going into the bank was beaten so badly with the guards, he was beaten with a hammer, that the guards weren't prepared to produce him in public, in open court, to, so people could see what had happened. And uh, after nine months, his condition still hadn't uh, improved. Some of you will, 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 will know the man. Um, he never recovered from that beating, um, I was so obvious like, physically and mentally that the, the guards ended up deciding it would be far too, even though the charge was being part of something that led to the death of a, a guard, that what they'd done to him it would be too embarrassing to charge him and bring him into open court. Now, torture of prisoners, I know it sounds like hype, but it was reasonably widespread at the time. Some people will have heard of the, the Salads train robbery when members of the Irish Republic and Socialist Party were quite badly, quite badly beat to try and extract confessions from them. Uh, and it wasn't just politicals it happened to, it also happened to criminals. Um, in fact, I remember a protest outside Sundrive Road Garda Station organised by Crims, and they called says RBD decent crims, looking at the subsequent careers of some of them, they weren't that decent at all. But their complaints were things like a particular guard by the name of Gleason, whose party trick was to scorch your balls with a cigarette lighter. Like this sort of thing was not unexceptional at all. This was the time when you had the heavy gang within the guards, essentially a group of detectives who were allowed to do pretty much, who travelled the country, extracted confessions, and were allowed to do pretty much as they wished, as long as they got results. The trial, of course, that Noel and Marie faced was before the, the non-jury Special Criminal Court. They were charged with capital murder, that's the murder of a policeman going about his duties. Uh, at that time in order, we still had the death penalty on the statute books, but it only applied what they call capital murder, that was killing a diplomat, a prison warder or a guard in the exercise of their duties. Everything else was a, a life sentence, but you could be hanged for, for those, even though the last hanging here was, it was in the early 50s. Uh, in, in June they were both sentenced to death, but Noel's death sentence was fairly quickly commuted to life imprisonment on the basis that he wasn't the one that had fired the gun. Worldwide protests took place. Now, I say worldwide because it did happen all over the world, it's just that they weren't very big. Uh, and all over the world, yeah, like people just saw it as somebody who had accidentally shot a cop in plain clothes. Well, either shouldn't be facing a death sentence because there shouldn't be a death sentence, or certainly in that case it wasn't like the, in, in any liberal's eyes, it wasn't sort of 
the worst type of thing you could do, that it shouldn't be debt. I remember Jean-Paul Sartre came to Dublin to give out to the government, and I remember in response to him, Conor Cruz O'Brien, who was, a mem along with several members of the government, a member of Amnesty International, which of course was against the death penalty, and the cruiser was also at that time the English government's great living Irish man and he spent the next few months travelling around Europe stammering apologies for uh, his government's uh, necessary uh, activities. Was there really a possibility that they could be hanged? Looking back, probably not a great one, but there was a slight possibility that it could have. We do know from talking to retired politicians that there were at least three members of the cabinet who did want an execution to be carried out. Uh, that was uh, Cooney, who was the Minister for Justice, Donegan, who was Minister for Defence, and Liam Cosgrave, who was the Taoiseach. Uh, their argument was that there was a really big danger of the Northern Troubles spilling over the border, and they had to put the foot down now, and much better to put the foot down on somebody like the Murrays, who didn't have a support base around them, as opposed to doing it to a member of the provisional IRA where it would be a lot more emotional and so on. <clears throat> Those times that that, that, that sort of that, that sort of discussion in the cabinet was possible, sort of I suppose will remind us of how much some things have changed. Some things haven't some have and for the better. At the time we had yet another uh, Labour and Fine Gael coalition government, and they were presiding over a legal state of emergency. Uh, as I said, they were worried about the, uh, an overspill of the, of, of the struggle from the north. What this meant was that there was a very good chance, at the very least, having your name taken by the cops if you attend a public meeting of anything more left wing than the Labour Party, and sometimes even if you've been at a Labour Party meeting. Despite the Labour Party being the junior party in government at the time, the phones of their office, which used to be up on Gardner Place, I think at that stage, opposite the, the old sticky offices, they were being tapped by the branch. That subsequently came out in all the, uh, the, the later phone tapping scandals. Uh, the student Christian movement, hardly a, a dangerous, subversive outfit. Well, they ended up before the High Court because they'd written a letter to the old Hibernian magazine, which used to be run by John Mulcahy, the man who went on Silk the Phoenix, and it has nothing to do with uh, Jerry McGill's loony fucking semi fascist Hibernian magazine that came out with Drada for a few years. But the student has written this letter about the trial of the Murrays, the fact that there was no jury, the fact that the judge had ordered the media not to report on a couple of days of the trial where there was a lot of discussion about whether the statements were admissible because of the amount of torture that had gone on. And in fact, two papers that did report on it were subsequently cited for contempt. But the student Christian movement ended up before a high court because in their letter, they had said non-jury trial, so they put the word trial in inverted commas. Uh, so they ended up there. Um, and that wasn't just like a once-off thing. There was a chap in Fine Gael, I think he was the secretary of their, their South Central branch. His name is Martin Reynolds, lived up on Leeson Street. Now a Fine Gaeler, he wrote a letter saying, well, you know, the death penalty's a bit much and you can't really call it a trial if there's no jury. The response? Cops burst in, he was an architect, cops burst into his architect's office with guns, raiding us down, not because they thought he'd have guns right now, but to scare off his clients and customers. Now, mm -hmm. compared to that to a local Fine Gael officer. Um, so, as I said, the, uh, the times, we had the same two gang, crowds of gangsters in government, but the times were considerably different. And just to finish on how different they, they, they were, um, I think it was the Socialist Workers Movement, crowd that later became the Socialist Workers Party, organised a meeting about the state of emergency at the top of Grafton Street, just facing the gates of Stephen's Green. There were about a hundred people gathered around to listen to them. There was about a hundred cops there. There was about 30 branch men, like, you know, making it very obvious, wandering around with their notebooks, you know, and the, their jackets open so you could see the butt of the revolver. But, just across the road, like sort of 15, 20 feet away, there were about or three, 400 people who wanted to hear what was going on, but they were afraid to be seen in the crowd. Now, that gives you an idea of the atmosphere at the time. So, the Murrays had been sentenced to death, and then Noel had been reprieved. 
what was the response of the, the left? Well, the official Republican movement, unfortunately, um, so well, we don't want to be associated with any of this sort of scare We've done so much to put sort of the the, the, the allegation that we're, we're crazy gunmen behind us. Uh, you want, so they denied that Nolan Marie had ever been members of the organisation. They gave no support to the campaign against the death penalty. The provisionals at their Ardesh, they did adopt a motion from their Inchicor coming to support the anti-death penalty campaign. But I must say, all that ever led to was some people from the Inchicor coming being supportive. Sinn Féin and such did not give any support to the, the campaign over the Murrays. The Irish Council for Civil Liberties had just been set up that year. Their very first public meeting was about the death penalty. Again, because of the, the, the atmosphere of fear at the time, they managed to have a two-hour meeting about the death penalty and they didn't mention Nolan Murray Murray once in it. <laughs> the only two people who have been under sentence of death in Ireland like for 25 years to have a meeting on the death penalty, afraid to even mention them by name. Only one trade union came out, took up their case and said, no, what's going on here? It needs a bit of investigation, all these allegations of torture and death penalty of order. That was the, uh, the old mechanics union, the Automobile General Engineering and Mechanical Operatives Union, now part of SIP2. So it was in this atmosphere that the Dublin Murray Defence Committee was formed. The initiative set up had been taken by members of the Red Republican Party, uh, who had been a, a minor split from people's democracy. And again, because you should always throw in a joke or two, uh, one thing I do remember about the Red Republican Party, their banner, a lot of people used to make banners at the time, before with people like Baz and that, that would do lovely painted ones. So you get a bit of cloth and you get carpet tape, and, you, and you'd stick the carpet tape on, cut it out with the shape of letters and stick it on. So theirs should have said Red Republican Party, but they were marching down uh, the Falls Road in Belfast one day and everyone was pointing at them and they were wondering, have we finally been recognised? Is this a claim? No, nah, two of the letters had fallen off and the Red Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> But apart from the Red Republicans, um, there was some support from the IRSP, though they were pretty busy with their own stuff around the Salons train robbery. From the movement for a socialist republic, who were small Dublin-based uh, trust groups, some people in Limerick and Belfast as well, who ended up merging with People's Democracy. Some older independent republicans, particularly I remember, uh, I don't know if anyone else does, uh, John Brogan, who used to be only semi-laughingly referred to as the last of the Fenians, uh, I think it was on account of his age. Um, a number of groups, other groups gave verbal support but didn't really get involved at all. And then there were the, 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 the two or three teenage anarchists which sort of represented the anarchist movement in Dublin at the time. It wasn't at its healthiest point then. I think our biggest demonstration by the British, and its demands were very simple, like anybody should be able to support it, was like, abolish the death penalty. There should be no torture in Garda stations. There should be an inquiry into what went on. You know, it was, anybody could sign up to it, really. I think our biggest demonstration was about 300 people. The average demonstration was around 150 people. Though, of course, uh, and, though I suppose you could maybe double the numbers if you included the guards as supporters rather than just as escorts. Somebody really should put a banner, you know, in front of them, you know, Gardaí against that penalty. We would have got a great photo. They, they really turned out the numbers. Um, I suppose, like, you know, like, again, like, uh, even publicising stuff was more difficult then. You could go out and stick up posters and they could all be gone again ten minutes later. The old Dublin Corporation time used to employ a special crew to cover up posters with brown paper. Um, so you had to like try and get out in the morning. I think they start at five. So you try and start about half four. Or no, you try and they start at four. That's right. We go about half four. So that they covered up the Provo posters with our brown paper, but the paste would still be wet. So maybe you could just stick yours onto it, and they'd have twenty four hours to go. Go down and put the poster. You had at least a fifty fifty chance of being lifted, and at the very least spending twenty four hours in custody, which is a bit of a disincentive for people to do it. Like, you know, how many excuses can you make up to explain why you weren't in work yesterday? You could only have so many dead granny's funerals you had to go to. If and if you were working, there was again a better than evens chance that your workplace would be raided by armed cops. Now again, not because they expect to find them, but a way of pressuring the employer into getting rid of you. The, and, and as I said, like, you know, with no internet and all that, it was much diff more difficult to let people know what was happening or of activities that were coming up. There was also a problem that the, the dominant view on the, the, the Defence Committee was that support for the Murrays would primarily come from others who were facing state repression and 
at that time that meant the provost and the, the, the IRSP stroke ILLA and that meant that the campaign was directing most of its, uh, of its energies towards supporters of Republican armed struggle. So you were putting up a block against people really who weren't into Republican armed struggle. There were only a small minority of us on the committee who disagreed with that strategy and thought that we, we, we should be orienting ourselves to a lot broader uh, group of people. So no real attempt was made to have the Murray's case brought to the White Lords bar, you know, the one or two instances where we managed to get sympathetic journalists to just give sort of fact get factual things into the papers about what what had happened or as they'd have to say, what had been alleged to have happened. Uh, probably the from my point of view, the, the very worst example of where this narrow focus on the most militant uh, could lead was when we up the round room in the mansion house for a meeting against the death penalty. We managed to fill it. We put a lot of work into it. We managed to actually fill the round room of the mansion house. Unfortunately, the majority of people on the committee said, right, well, we need human rights advocates to speak. No problem there, absolutely no problem. So who they decide was the greatest human rights advocate? Unfortunately, it was Father Dennis Fall from Dungannon. Now, he'd done great work exposing torture of Republican prisoners in the North, but he was Father Dennis Fall. The Catholic Church, human rights, not too sure about it. And I'll tell you why I was probably right not to be sure about it. Uh, in the middle of his speech, Fall announced that he was against all murder, all death penalties. It didn't matter whether it was by a hangman's rope or the use of a contraceptive. <laughs> well, jeez, how not to get sensible, liberal, progressive-minded people involved in the campaign. And there was also a committee in Belfast, which is pretty much the same political mix, but with a few, a few more anarchists. Uh, and two people I would like to mention who did sterling work in the, the Belfast Committee, and both of whom were later murdered by uh, loyalist death squads. Uh, they were Miriam Daly, uh, who was chairperson of the IRSP, and Noel Little, who was a leading member of the Red Republican Party and later of the, the IRSP. Other small defence committees and activities were set up in London, Glasgow, Manchester, Oxford, Paris, Germany, Japan for some reason, and of course the, the, the USA. And these tend to be a mix of anarchists and people in the Irish emigrant communities. Finally, the one thing I suppose that a lot of this campaigning did lead to was that Marie was given a retrial, and at the retrial we decided that it wasn't capital murder because there was no way she could have known that a guard off duty in plain clothes was a guard, therefore it wasn't capital murder. So her sentence was changed to life imprisonment. Uh, while they were inside, everyone who came in contact with them, whether friends or enemies, even the, the prison warders, even the lawyer who represented them and subsequently became president of Ireland, uh, Mary Robinson was their, their brief, uh, all said like, uh, disagree with them, agree with them, whatever, but that they were definitely idealistic, honest, and as Mary Robinson said, truly fine people. The other thing that happened while they were in prison, there was a a drawn out but unsuccessful campaign to win conjugal rights from the right to start a family because by the time they were due for release it would be too old to start a family or even be beyond uh, child child uh, bearing age. Uh, that campaign was, needless to say, uh, unsuccessful. One little thing from there though again that's sort of funny, uh, Albert Meltzer in London wrote to Cardinal Tommaso Fee, at the time as the head of the Catholic Church in Ireland, the Archbishop of Armagh, asking would he intercede with the Irish government because he was a great protector of the family and family values. So would he intercede and say, well, would they look at the possibility of very long-term prisoners having the right to start a family before it's too late for them? And O'Fee replied to Albert saying, no, I'd be better off you just write them yourself. I have no influence with government in Dublin. <laughs> the Catholic Church has no influence with the government in Dublin. <laughs> anyway, after um, 18 years inside, and Marie for a long time was the longest serving woman prisoner in eight, after 18 years, they were finally released on parole in 1993. And I leave it there because John is going to give you the, the real stuff now. Right.